Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So today, the other material which we are going to talk about is your uh, paint. We will be talking about paint, uh, varnish, distemper, etc. Okay. So I'll be obviously the notes will be shared to you. I'll show you some uh, videos. Go through some videos on these topics because we need to go fast. So I'll show you some videos so that you can understand better. Okay. So I'll share my screen now. Let me share my screen. We have to see what are the major constraints of pain, what different types of pain and the defects in pain. First one, major ingredients of pain. The major ingredients are gaze, vehicle or carrier, dryer, coloring pigments and last one, solvents or ink. First one, it is gaze. As the name says, it is a solid substance in a fine state of division that forms the bulk of the paint. The characteristic of a paint depends upon the base. It imparts durability to the surface. So let's see which are the important examples of the base. First one is white lead. White lead, which are used in the wooden surfaces, are carbonate of lead. It is an important point. White lead is used for wooden purposes. Next one is red lead. Red lead is an oxide of lead that forms the base for the lead paint. It is majorly used for the iron purposes. Next one is pink white. Pink white is the oxide of the thing that forms the base of all the pink paints. It is less durable and it is difficult to work with it. It is basically transparent in nature. Next one is oxide of iron. It forms a base for all the iron paints. It is usually yellowish, black to brown color, and it forms the prime spot for the iron paint. Next example is the titanium white. Titanium white is a material that possesses intense opaque skin. It is a very non poisonous and a transparent, it forms a transparent film. It is usually used for the retrieving cause of a enamel. Next one is antimony white. It is, its usage is similar to that of titanium white and its texture is also opaque. Next one is aluminum powder. Aluminum powder forms the base for the aluminum paint. Its property is that it blocks the moisture coming of the wooden surface where it is used and it will prevent the cracking and warping of the It's generally used as a prime pot for new woodwork. Next one and the last one is lithophone. That it is mainly used for the interior work of interior quality. It is actually a mixture of zinc sulfate and barrage. Its appearance is somewhat same as the oxide of zinc. It is of an inferior quality, so it is used for interior work of interior nature. Next one is the vehicle carrier binder. It is actually liquid substances that holds the ingredient of the paint in a liquid suspension. The uses of the vehicle is that it makes the paint possible to spread over the surface evenly. And also it forms a binder to the ingredient of the paint so that they can stick or adhere to the surface. Let's see the examples of vehicle or carrier or the binder. First one and the most common one is the linseed oil. It forms a vehicle for oil paint. 
Next one is tank oil, which has a superior quality than that of the linseed oil. It is majorly used for preparing the paints of superior quality. Next one is poppy oil. Poppy oil possesses some colors, so its colors is long lasting also. So it is used for making the paints of delicate colors. Last one is nut oil. It is not so durable, so it is used for ordinary works. So that's all are the examples of different types of vehicles. The next one is dryers. Dryers are that ingredient that accelerates the process of drying of the paint after its application. And it has certain drawbacks. It has a tendency to attack the color of the paint and also it will sometimes destroy the elasticity of the paint. Therefore, we have to limit the amount of dryers in a particular paint. It should not be more than the 10% of the paint. Major examples of the dryers are certain metals in powder form in a volatile liquids. The metals like cobalt, black, manganese are used. Next example is lugar, which is the most commonly used for dryer. Then red lead, sorry for the spelling mistake, red lead. Last one is the sulfate of manganese. Next ingredient is the coloring pigments. Whenever we don't want the color of the base to appear on the paint, we use different coloring pigments. Coloring pigments are of five types. First one is natural or the earth color, which include ambers, ionocytes, etc. Next one is calcined color. Calcined color, for example, Indian red, carbon black, red lead, etc. Next is precipitate like Persian blue, brown green, etc. Next one is lakes. Lakes means these are china clay which are discolored using some kinds of special dye. Then last type of coloring pigment is metal powder. Usually a metal powder like of aluminum, bronze, copper, zinc, etc. are used. So Next one is, the concentration of a pigment in a particular paint is expressed in a term called as pigment volume concentration number or PVCM. It gives a fractional or the percentage volume of the pigment in a total volume solid content of the dry paint. For example, if we say the PVCM value for the metals, it is 25 to 40. So that's all about coloring material. Next one is the solvents or the thinners. The function of a solvent is to make the paint thin so that it can be applied rapidly over the surface. It also helps in the preparation of the paint to the porous surface. The most commonly used solvent is cubic of turpentine. So these are the five basic ingredients, various vehicle, coloring pigment, solvents and dryer. Coming to, sorry we have to see the examples of thinner, sorry I forgot, examples of thinner. First, the first type of thinner is the oil thin, for oil thin mainly used to thinner are serpentine, benzene or naphtha. In case of spirit liquids or lacquer paint, alcohol is the thinner. In case of cellulose paint, ethane amyl acetate is the thinner. In case of or in distemper, water is the thinner. That's the important point. Water is the thinner for the cement paint and the distemper. For enamel paints, the petroleum spirit is used as the thinner. Next, coming to different types of paints, and their uses. First one is aluminium paint. As we have said earlier, aluminium paints have aluminium powder as their base. They are usually used for painting the gas tank, marine fires, oil, storage tanks, etc. Next one is asbestos paint. It is usually used on the surface which is exposed to acidic gases and heat. 
next one is vitamin pink these are actually uh, the asphalt or the vegetable debris which is dissolved in any type of oil or petroleum it is mainly used for painting underwater iron works vitamin pink is used for underwater iron works next one is cellulose paint these are used on the surface that ha have to withstand high heat or cold weather that is cellulose paint next one is cement paint paint usually consists of of white cement pigment and certain additives they are mainly used for painting corrugated iron sheet next is colloidal paints they have no inert material mixed with they are mainly used for exterior and interior work. Next one is emulsion paint. Emulsion paint has its binding material as polyvinyl acetate or synthetic resin. Next one is enamel paint. Enamel paint have white lead, oil, chlorine spirit, and certain resinous matter, which are mainly used for the internal and external work. Next kind of paint is the graphite paint, which have a black color. So it is used mainly for the iron purposes, exposed to ammonia, chlorine, sulfur gases, etc. These are mainly used in mines, underground railway construction, etc. Last type of paint is the plastic paint. It uses a variety of uh, plastic as some fiber cement. And it has a very pleasing appearance and an attractive color. So it is used in the auditorium, showrooms, etc. So that was about different types of paints. Now, the different defects that occur in the painting process. Let's see them one by one. First one is blistering. Blistering means it is a formation of bubble like shades in the painted surface. It usually occurs when the water is later gets trapped in the paint layer and later it will form a bubble-like structure that is called a blistering. That we can see what water is trapped in this particular bubble-like structure. It is blistering. Next one is blooming. Blooming means it is the formation of dull patches. As you can see in the figure, formation of dull patches. Major due to poor quality of paint or improper ventilation. Next is fading. It is means you know it is a gradual loss of the color. This can also be uh, also be due to the poor quality of the paint and also sometimes due to major exposure towards sunlight. Next one is flaking. In this type of defect, uh, some portion of the plate film get uh, not stick properly to the surface. They will later flake, flake off. This is called as flaking. This is happening when there is a poor adhesion between the paint and the surface to be painted. That is flaking. Now, coming to flashing. It means there is a presence of glossy patches in the painted surface due to some poor workmanship, some cheap paint, or due to weather conditions. Next kind of preferred is the green. Green means that we can see the background or the surface that have we have painted clearly even after painting. That is called as green. Next one is running. This usually occurs in the body like a metal body or very finished surface or the smooth surface. It means that the paint will run back and leave some area or the surface uh, uncovered by paint. It is called as running. Next one is sagging. When we are applying a very thick layer of paint, it is in a vertical or an inclined surface, as the paint will run off from the surface. That is what is called as tagging. Next one is taconification. Taconification means the formation of soft patches in the painted surface. It may be due to some alkaline effect 
on the factor bed. Next one is tracing. Tracing are some hair like cracks. If the cracks are more large and more visible, then an interconnected that form the alligator cracking. This type of defect is also there in the concrete also. We will see later. So that are the different defects found in the frame bed surface. So we have covered all the aspects of frame. The next one is the varnish. Varnish is actually the solution of a residual sub substance in alcohol, oil or turpentine. Varnish is majorly used for the wooden purposes. The major ingredients are the resins like copper, shellac, lac, etc. And it has a wire and solvent. So these three are the major ingredients of varnish. There are different types of varnish like oil varnish, spirit varnish, turpentine varnish, water varnish, etc. This classification is mainly based on the type of vehicle that is used in the varnish. Next one is the distemper. Distemper means water base because they use water as the carrier. The base for the distemper is chalk or lime. The binder used may be glue or casein. It is usually used for the plaster paper. It is not exposed to the weather. Distemper is called as water paint. It is used for the plaster paper. It is not exposed to the weather. So that's the end of this video. So we have covered another building material. Okay. Now, matter geotextiles. Is my screen visible to you? Am I sharing the screen? Hello. Hello. Am I sharing my screen? Okay. I think now I'm sharing my screen. So now the next topic which you are going to I'm going to show you a video on is your geotextiles. So let me start it. One key piece of technology that holds the earth together is geotextiles, which are manufactured permeable liners to help contain soil in a specific area. Geotextiles have many applications which can increase soil stability and provide erosion control as well as aid in drainage. Throughout the years, geotextiles have been altered and improved in order to broaden the amount of applications it can be used for. There are two main types of geotextiles that each support different applications, which are woven and non-woven geotextiles. The key difference between the two types is the way it was threaded or manufactured, as well as specific applications it is going to be used for. Geotextiles were first utilized in the ancient Egyptian pyramids and in Roman times where straw threads are woven together in order to support roadways. Back then, fabrics were used in order to keep the stability of the roadways. Without the geotextiles in place, the roadways had problems with unstable soil shifting or running after a long period of time. Before geotextiles were officially created, 
the Egyptian people used straw mats to stabilize the foundation of the pyramids. What are geotextiles? Geotextiles are used in association with civil engineering projects and are embedded into the soil to provide stability to the ground surface. The layer of the geotextile is permeable, which may not hear any sound map freely through the soil layer without eroding away the soil. A geotextile can also be used to separate soil layers and reinforce the soil as a foundation that is going to be built on. These thin layers of fabric can be used for a wide variety of projects due to its strength and drainage characteristics. There are also weaknesses that geotextiles have that reduce their functionality. Geotextiles are susceptible to blockage from sediment buildup of organic residues, fungi, algae, or even plant roots. Over time, these organic residues create chemical compounds or slimes that block the pores of the geosynthetic material. There are two main categories of geotextiles based on their manufacturing process and what applications they are used for. Woven and non-woven geotextiles have very similar physical properties but can have a variety of pore size openings and fiber types. New polymers have been used to increase lifespan and overall strength of the textile. Woven geotextiles are formed from a combination of monofilament, multifilament, and silk films or yarns. These films are manufactured from weaving together the various types of yarns or film strips. Woven geotextiles are manufactured in different materials based on the project and specific pore size opening required. The key application of woven geotextiles are for separation of soils and to add reinforcement to improve the textile strength of the soil. Woven geotextiles are usually not used for drainage due to tight and permeable weaves, but have a high load carrying capacity. These geotextiles are commonly used for roads or parking lots. Non-woven geotextiles are usually formed by molding short staple-like fibers together or to mold continuous filament into a thin layer. A needle punch manufacturing process is generally used for non-woven geotextiles. This process requires a needle to intertwine the various fibers together to form one solid material layer. Chemical or thermal bonding can also be used to create non-woven geotextiles. This process fuses the perpendicular fibers together in a random orientation, which can result in a large porosity and permeability. These geotextiles are primarily used in filtration and drainage projects. The six key applications of geotextiles are filtration, drainage, separation, cushion, reinforcement, and water. Separation is when the material is placed between two different soil layers so the integrity of both materials can be maintained or improved. Reinforcement is using the geotextile to provide tensile strength to the system. Filtration uses the geotextile material to allow flow across its plane surface. Drainage is implemented when a geotextile material can transmit fluid within the plane surface of the structure. The geotextile can also provide protection by acting as a cushion above or below the soil in order to prevent damage such as punctures during the placement of overlying material. The most crucial aspect of applying a geotextile in a project is the installation on the construction site. During installation, geotextiles are repeatedly subjected to dynamic bolt loading of armored units, which are often exceeded service stress. The geotextile is put into place by rolling out on the subgrade in order to hold the fabric into place until the top aggregate is installed. It is acceptable to use either pins or weights. The aggregate should be back dumped from a lower height to prevent any tears in the textile. These heavy units are often dumped onto the geotextile filter layer from a certain height, which induces high dynamic impact onto the material. This would result in the loss of mechanical strength, hydraulic efficiency, or severest puncturing the material.
Overall, the use of geotextiles in soil construction adds a sufficient amount of benefits to any construction project that an engineer has to design. Geotextiles have been utilized since the ancient Egyptian and Roman times, where they have helped create the pyramids and early roadways. And throughout the years, geotextiles have been altered to improve the order to broaden the amount of application it can be used for. Geotextiles are essential for the future soil construction project. So this way your geotextiles, they are different woven or non-woven. What are they used for? All those was mentioned here. Now we'll see another one more uh, topic. Now we'll see the type of steels, what the grades of steel or the type of steels we are using, how we are using. You can check this video here through which you will understand what are the different types of steels, mild steel, deformed bar steels, all these things. Let me start. Second so, so types of steel, right? We'll start from types of steel. Steel is First of all, understand, so what do you mean by, so what is the importance of providing steel in the concrete, that is in the buildings or any structure, right? Concrete is good in compression, but it is weak in tension, right? Because uh, it is a brittle material, bonding is good between the particles, but in order to carry the tensile forces or tensile stresses, what are the, what are the stresses that is induced in the material due to the application of the load? Right? It will not, concrete will not carry the stress, that is tensile stresses or load. Concrete is good in compression and weak in tension. In order to avoid, in order to use strength in tensile, we are providing the steel. The main purpose of providing the steel in the structure. Right? This is the basic one. Right now, so what are the types of steel mean? Types of steel is uh, very important. Right? Generally, there are two types of steel, right? Generally, there are, sorry. Generally, there are two types of steel. Those are mild steel, right? And deformed steel bar. Okay? But number of, uh, size of bars we have in market is from 8 mm to 50 mm you will get. Okay? I am talking about the size of the bar, right? But those materials, okay, how they construct, how they manufacture, on which type of material they have used for the manufacturing of the steel, okay, we will discuss 
in this video right while still okay first you should understand some general points about the steel right the grade of the steel is dependent on the yield strength of the steel yield strength means at what point the steel will fail right at what point or at what strength if you apply the load on a steel at what point at up to certain limit the steel will take the load after that it will fail that is the yield strength of the steel right next one yield strength is considered the construction right and the third point generally steel is available in market from 8 mm to 32 mm right 8 mm to 32 mm right so we can take any type of dia for construction it depends on our design purpose what we have designed for our beam for our column right so these are the general point okay you can see my dear friend the scale of the my steel so my steel is nothing but the you can see the surface of this my steel the my steel is is a plain surface right it is a plain surface you can see in the scale right next we will study the properties of the my steel okay my steel they have been given in the is code 432 and part 1 That is 1982. These are four names. Uh, you can refer. Okay. So mild steel bars are used for tensile stress of RCC. Both cement concrete slab beams in the reinforced cement concrete work. Okay. Mild steel you can use for RCC work. But these steel bars are plain in surface and are round sections of diameter 6 to 50 mm. Okay. it means the available sizes of this uh, my steel is 6 to 50 mm but we are using 8 mm up to 32 mm 32 mm because we have some restriction we have some restriction due uh, that is for the construction we can't use more than 32 mm if you use what will happen the concrete will not pour inside of the beam or any beam or columns any structure or any shape you are designing okay for that we are only considering up to 32 mm for different uh, psc beams or psc girders or bridges they can use higher grade of the steel right because the, they require a higher strength and in that we have to use the psc beam that is three stress beam right so here you can see but we will use only 8 mm to 32 mm in construction that is due to some uh, limitations in the construction site we can't use up to 50 mm okay we have to use up to 32 to 36 is a maximum right so these sorry, these rods are manufactured in long length and can be cut quickly and be sent easily without damage it means you can easily bend my thing you can easily bend and you, you can easily cut that is the main advantage of this mild steel you can do any shape to mild steel okay you can do any shape to mild steel you can bend up that is the main advantage that's why they are using the mild steel for any work okay so what is the content of mild steel okay next is contains it consists of iron 
I think I'll explain this without him, without this. Hello, with left them. See, so the mild steels is consist of different materials which are your this consist of iron, your mild steel will be plain and there will be no this circular you see the lines are not there which you see in the general uh, steel bars. So when you don't see these uh, circular lines, horizontal lines here on the rods, these are your mild steel bars. Okay, and they are uh, they consist of irons which are allowed with less than 0.3 percent carbon, most commonly between 0.1 to 0.25 percent. So this is important point, which is your mild steel. The what does it contain? It contains iron from 0.1 to 0.25 percent. This is an important question which you should know the answer. That is your your mild steel consists of iron. How much percentage maximum from 0.1 to 0.25 percent? Okay, or you can say 0 0.3, less than 0 0.3 mm, it should be, sorry, your less than 0 0.3 percent should be your iron present in your, this one, my steel. Due to low strain, these bars are seldom used. Obviously, we don't use this. When we have this horizontal, those uh, bars which you see that are horizontal, that has horizontal uh, strikes around here, around these bars, they are uh, they they will give you more uh, better grip and more uh, better strength as compared to these that's why we generally don't uh, use much on this uh, mild steel bars we don't generally use okay so for constructions here uh, fe that is the uh, fe denotes iron and your 250 denotes the yield strength suppose the the term which we use in your uh, steel bars when you're using steel bars what we say FE215, FE415, FE250. So what does that mean? That is iron that is present here. Uh, FE denotes the iron and the 250 will denote your yield strength Okay, in megapascal. Newton per mm square. Okay, so that will, your 250 will denote the yield strength. That means how much, after how, after how much load it is going to fail. Okay, so let me. Okay. Now you see, now we will, these are your HYST bars, you can see, okay, as deformed bars are rods or steels provided with lugs, ribs, these are your ribs, you see, these are your ribs or lugs, you can say, or deformation on the surface of bar, these bars minimize slippage because you know when you have these ribs around your bars, unlike your mild steel, what will happen when you have these ribs? There will be proper grip, as I told you in the last slide. There will be a total perfect grip and more better grip than the mild steel, which has no uh, this horizontal uh, bars or sorry, the horizontal lines over it. Okay, so this will provide a grip in your concrete and increase the bond between the two materials. Okay, so these are important in your steels and that's why we use these kind of uh, bars in our construction purposes. Then we have... Which one is best? Um, Wait, let me Let me share you, let me share you my, let me show you, oh, so not sure, sorry, I'll share with you the link now for your attendance, you just give your attendance, there, before that let me just show you, yeah, these deformed bars have more tensile stress, than that of your mild steel plane bars, okay. Hello. So, mild steel plane bars, you don't have these uh, ribs there or lugs and therefore what happens, these kind of bars will give you more tensiles, they can uh, carry more tensile, they have more tensile strength as compared to your normal, the mild steel plane, mild steel bars, okay. These bars can be used without end hooks, okay. So, the deformation should be spaced along the bar and substantially in uniform distances. This you know these things like when you are placing these rods you have to give a uniform distance between them the spacing ma'am we can see any slide 
Oh, you, you can't see. The form bars, oh, not sorry, the form bars, these kind of bars which will have your lugs or ribs, these are uh, generally they will give more higher strength as compared to your displaying mild steel bars and therefore we use this kind of bars mostly, okay. And we, we, we know this thing that we have to give a uh, spacing should be provided when we use these kind of bars, okay, equal spacing. Then what is in the video is that. This is one important thing which is to be noted that pole twisted deformed that is ribbed or tore steel bars. These bars are recommended as best quality steel bars for construction work by structural engineers. Okay. Let me before that let me to share the link also with you all. Uh, where to share before? Okay, let me share first the attendance link. Okay, where is the attendance link? Natural testing evaluation. Link is shared. Uh, go and give your attendance there. Accepting. Mem.